Okay. Is uh, all right. If we can give a hand to the Human Relations uh, Commission here in Shum County. Mm -hmm. I think they did an excellent job with the candidates, and let's give another hand to the candidates who are still here. And to each and every one of you um, for coming out on a Thursday to see this level of involvement in this process is just amazing. Actually, when I came through earlier, the reason I just want to explain to those who are still here, I wanted to yield because I know that there, were, there was interest, the residents wanted to hear from the candidates. So that's actually why um, I'm, I'm not tired of anything, <laughs> but this is what I wanted to emphasize. What I'm here to do is walk through the process. What we have before us is an elected official, obviously, has now vacated office. And this is a unique situation and actually now we rely upon a democratic process to peaceful, peacefully transition power. Now, in the absence of information, a lot of times there's a lot of chaos, confusion, what's going to happen. So what I want to do now is walk through the process of what will happen in terms of how we will fill this vacancy. I'll walk through the process and I'll go through as fast as I can because I know it's been a long evening. But more importantly, if I don't answer your questions going through this process, then I want to, at the end, answer everyone's question because the most important thing I can ever do is make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of this process and how it will take its course. My name is Don Davis. I serve in the North Carolina Senate District 5. Um, but I also wear another hat, and that hat is I serve as the chair of the 1st Congressional um, District in North Carolina, which obviously encompasses Edgecombe County. And actually, I've been serving in this capacity over the course of about, perhaps about 15 years. And um, off and on, but about 15, 15 years combined. And actually, I was listening to the experience of the, sh the candidates here, and we all have different strengths and weaknesses, but one of the particular things that I'm often called, believe it or not, across the state is to deal with how to make these transitions in power. Um, I will tell you, I have an extensive backtrack uh, record of doing this. Um, we did one at a congressional level when Congressman Butterfield first went into the Congress. Um, many remember Senator Holloman, uh, Representative Hall. Um, I've, I've done countless, many of these processes. And the reason, too, I want to emphasize this, I just tend to be a, shoot, a straight shooter, is I know there's been a lot of comments and things, rumors and things out there. Well, I'm ready to kind of put a squash to that. And this is what I want to guarantee, three things to you, is that we'll have a smooth process that we're going to have a transparent process and we're going to have a fair process. Smooth, transparent, and fair. And I will put my guarantee on that. All right, I feel that confident about this. So, we're going to walk through just some background information. We'll talk about the purpose, eligibility, the plan of organization, special rules of the day, Robert's rules. And, and, and let me just stop right here for a second because this is what my task is. is to come in and provide assistance to your county, to the county party chair, and making sure that all these things work the way they're supposed to. The North Carolina Constitution, there's some constitutional issues here. The North Carolina law, to make sure we adhere to the state law, that governs this process, the national democratic bylaws and charter, the state bylaws and charter, Robert rules of order, and then the rules for the day that we establish as a committee. So my task is to make sure that all these things come together the way they should, so that even if, this is one thing we know, we can never avoid a complaint, but even if a complaint comes, my task is to make sure that this is airtight. 
and that it would stand the test. We'll go on and talk about expectations, especially for the candidates who are still here, and um, what will happen prior to the meeting itself. We're going to start with just the background. The Democratic Party chair, I do realize this is the Human Relations Commission, um, but the reason I'm here is because statutorily, the Democratic Party has the obligation of making the recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. And it was based on Sheriff Knight actually being a registered Democrat. So this is not partisan by any other means. If it was the Republicans, then they would have to be here because that's the law of North Carolina. But um, Roosevelt Hill, Higgs is the chair. And um, only the members, I want to emphasize this, only the members of the county executive committee will participate in this process. Here's the purpose. We've given a lot of hands to a lot of outstanding residents, but I think it's also appropriate tonight to, for us to give a hand to Sheriff Knight, who served his community. <laughs> he ser served the community with distinction and in his service, and like I think we all want to get to one day, and some are probably already there, he, he's retiring and transitioning. So what happens then, is because of his transition or his retirement that he submitted, the General Statute 162-5.1 takes into effect, okay? And that now triggers how we actually transition and make this transition. What it does, in essence, because Sheriff Knight was a registered Democrat, it tasks the Democratic Party of Edgecombe County the executive committee is actually the statutory language to make a recommendation through a process that's actually called consultation. They consult with the board of commissioners. But interestingly, by local law, Edgecombe County and all counties are not handled the same. So if you hear something from somewhere else, don't worry about that because Edgecombe is actually in a different category under 5.1 in the statute. And under 5.1, what essentially it says is when the party makes this recommendation to the Board of Commissioners, it's a binding recommendation, and the county commissioners have no choice whatsoever but to elect, and that's the language in the statute, the person that's sent forward from the party if it's done within 30 days of the vacancy. So the time frame that we have is basically March the 30th, and then I want to just make sure that other candidates realize this, you're filling the unexpired term of the four years, which would be set to then expire um, December the 18th. And, okay, eligibility, I heard these requirements were actually mentioned earlier. These are some of the core things that we're looking at. 21 years old, you have to be a resident one year, and this is from the time that the board of commissioners actually make the recommendation or accept the recommendation and elect the candidate. So whenever they receive it after the 30th at the next meeting, then the date is one year prior to that day. Um, just a couple side notes. I'm not sure if these were mentioned. Um, obviously, I, I don't know that any of the candidates are members of the General Assembly, but if so, they would have to vacate office, and if they are attorneys, they would have to cease practicing. Those are the only other elements that I don't think that were necessarily mentioned earlier. But the reason I mention them is because they're in the statute, the North Carolina law. <clears throat> okay. Over years of doing this, a lot of the executive committee members have asked me what criteria and I've just kind of developed criteria that counties have looked at over the years, whether it's looking at a person's background, the civic involvement, knowledge of the issues, communication skills, people skills, ability to campaign. These are not any hard set criteria. These are just things that the executive committee <coughs> members can consider. Again, what's most important is the eligibility. These are dealing with constitutional and statutory obligations here. Okay? <coughs> 
Now I want to transition and get into the plan of organization. The plan of organization, I want to say they're the bylaws of the North Carolina Democratic Party. We call them the plan of organization. So if you hear me say plan of organization, think in the terms of the bylaws of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> bylaws of the party says the quorum requirement is 40% of the executive committee member. Um, only the members of the executive committee are actually able to participate in this process. And when I say participate, it's when the meeting is called to order, it's only the executive committee members. We're not dealing with guests, anyone from the audience, and that's going to be really important, and I'm going to jump ahead of myself to the candidates. If you're interested in really moving forward, you have to have a nomination from an executive committee member. And that's key. I've come to these at times, and I really try to emphasize this because some have thought they could, as long as the person may have been in the same party, they could rely upon them to make the nomination. That's not the rules. You have to have a member, actually member, of the executive committee to make the nomination, and only those members can actually interact with the chair once the meeting is kicked off. Now, this, not, this is not to say that you can't campaign, make calls, and do all that in advance. But once this meeting kicks off, it's this executive committee. Um, the executive committee members, if you're not able to make the meeting, you can send a proxy. And basically, the plan of organization says you would have to send someone from your precinct, from your precinct, to do the proxy. Um, members, however, according to the bylaws of the plan of organization of the Democratic Party, you must submit that proxy form to the chair or secretary before that meeting is gathered in. If the meeting's called to order and it's not in, it can't count, you can't vote. That's the rules, okay? So I'm saying if you know of any proxies, make sure that that's done in advance because, again, if it's not, it doesn't matter as soon as it hits, if it's submitted afterwards, they cannot vote. <clears throat> Under the rules, the party rules, um, plan of organization, the majority vote is 50% plus one. The reason that becomes important is this is not a plurality. The plurality means that whoever has the highest votes of the four candidates, that's not how this process is done. What will happen is we'll have a set number of votes. Let's say it's 200, I'm using a round number. If it's 200, then a, a majority plus 50% plus one would be 101 votes needed. So that means if for some reason you didn't get that in the first round of a ballot, then it, you move, have to eliminate someone and move into another round of ballot. And you keep going through that process until someone has a majority plus one, okay? And as I was explaining, if you don't have a majority, you pull out under the rules, the lowest vote getter, and then you do another round of balloting, and you keep going. Now, what happens if there's a tie between the lowest vote getter, then you have a runoff to who is eliminated from those two. I guess that took too long to get back to us. Right. Let's see. I'm just going to continue on for time's sake. My battery went dead, apparently. But uh, we'll continue on. <clears throat> so, this is what I would like to also emphasize. Is this is not the way the voting mechanism works under the rules, this is not a one vote per person per se. Under the rules, elected officials of the county, everyone who's elected as a Democrat, they're entitled to one vote. The rules also say that you have precinct chairs and vice chairs of the county. That's actually a weighted vote. And that weighted vote is based on the turnout in the last 
gubernatorial election. It's one per 100 um, people that turned out in the election. And the way that will work is, um, let's say the precinct is entitled then to 10 votes based on the turnout of the last election. You have the precinct chair and the vice chair. And what happens, you equally, equally divide in those 10 votes amongst the chair and the vice chair. If one or the other does not show up to the meeting, the other is entitled to vote the full strength of the precinct. But the point that I want to emphasize is it's not a one-for-one, one, it's a weighted vote. So if you're looking and you're saying, well, why do some people have more voting strength than others? Because it's based on the turnout mechanism in terms of how um, we calculate voting in the party. Next, I want to be clear on this. Um, this has been a question that has come up. Um, can an executive committee member actually be a candidate? And the answer to that question is, actually under Robert Rules of Order, you can be a candidate and be on the committee itself. So I'm, I'm just sharing that is actually permitted under the rules. Um, this is the other thing that's permitted under the rules. If you're entitled to a vote, you can actually split that vote. The only thing the rules under the rules, you can't exceed the vote. So if you have one vote, I can say, well, I'm going to give 0.5 of a vote to so-and-so and 0.5 to so-and-so. And that really, you see that play out more so with the precincts. Um, let's say if someone has 10 votes, they could do two here, two here, two here. There's nothing what's wrong with splitting those votes. Let me be clear on what I'm about to say. There's no secret ballot. Okay, that question has come to me several times. And I want to be clear, Article 9, um, Section 12 of the DNC bylaws and charter prohibits specifically secret ballots. Now, the reason I emphasize that is my suggestion and the way I've typically done this is just a roll call vote. You can do a ballot, because that's the question that's coming, can you actually do a ballot? The answer is you can do a ballot, but here is the issue. You have to print your name and sign that ballot, and then those ballots become subject to inspection. Remember I said earlier, transparency. Now, I'm just being candid. I was in another county doing the same process. We went back and forth. And there were some individuals who asked me, can we just do the ballot? We're going to take the chance if they come look and inspect the ballots. And guess what? Somebody came and looked, inspected the ballots. They didn't like the way, in this case, an elected official voted because they told them something else. And they ran against them in the next election. So I'm, I'm just telling you up front, there's total transparency. I, you got to figure out your own politics, OK? No secret ballots. Um, an issue that also comes up a question, if you are an officer uh, of the precinct, um, do you have to vacate office if for some chance you were to run? And the answer to that is no. You do not have to vacate office. Now, under the old plan, the plan was amended you would have to have, and that's why that question often that question often comes up. But actually, under the new plan, and let me let me clarify, under an election scenario, if you were going to file and you're going on, you know, to the, to be on the typical ballot at the county office, then then there's a different mechanism than filling the vacancy. This is a vacancy that we're filling. Now, what I want to do last year in terms of rules. I want to get into special rules of the day. Um, we always set special rules of the day, and the reason for that is um, these are things that are not going to be covered in Robert's rules or the bylaws of the party or the law. The first thing is rule number one that we'll um, present to the executive committee is that the chair shall have the responsibility to make an order for the day of the meeting. 
Rule number two is there will be a process for obtaining recognition. Um, the person will need to name themselves, uh, state their names, and the precinct or office that they hold. Rule number three, and this is important for the candidates um, and the executive committee members. If you go to an executive committee member to get them to nominate you, please make sure they know that under rules that's been presented, they'll have two minutes to make a nominating speech. If somebody wants to come behind that person and make a seconding speech to the nomination, they will have one minute to do. And let me be clear, when you're nominating someone, which is different from the main motion, a second is actually not required. In order to bring your name forward, you only need one person. But you can have what's more ceremonial, a second to that nomination. But either way, it'll be two minutes on the main nomination and one minute on subsequent nominations. Rule number four, now if you advance and come forth as a candidate under the rules, um, we're proposing three minutes. This is more than sufficient time. Typically, you've had these forms. At this time, we're getting ready to get into the voting. So it'll be a three minute um, speech. So I will say to the candidates, have your best three minute speech ready to go that night. And start working on it now, the best three minute speech. Rule number five, once everybody makes those speeches and we typically do them under the rules in alphabetical order, okay? We're just doing them in alphabetical order. Um, but after everybody finishes, what will happen if the executive committee members want to talk amongst themselves before they actually vote to actually caucus, they'll be given time to caucus. Now, that's their time to go pitch for their candidates and try to swing anybody. That's kind of how this process works as well. And especially, let me hear this. I mean, let me share this. And I'm just telling you tips to those candidates who are running. Okay, you may ask people to support you. And there may be somebody else supporting somebody else. You may say, okay, if my person falls out in the first round because we don't make it, then can you come on with us in the second round? Those are the things that are taking place in these caucuses. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be transparent so everybody know and okay, start thinking about these things. Um, and then rule number seven, um, this is dealing with if now you're pulling out the lowest vote getter and there's a tie, how to deal with it under the rules. Now the agenda for that day, I'm just gonna run down the agenda. We'll call the meeting to order. We'll have our Pledge of Allegiance, it's number two. We're gonna have welcoming remarks by the chair. Then we'll have a roll call. We'll call all the names of the members of the executive committee, uh, committee members. And after we get through that, we're gonna have um, approval of the role of delegates. Now this is gonna be key. I know there's been a lot of discussions and talk about, well, who is the executive committee, okay? I can tell you right now, we pretty much have that list about together, but I do want to explain what's going on and, and I really want to emphasize this. It may seem like, wow, I mean, who is, who is the executive committee and why don't we have the list? But this is what is really the issue at hand and I may have explained this to a few that's called in to me and I have gotten several calls. The timing of Sheriff Knight's resignation actually coincided with the reorganization of the Democratic Party's um, structure. We are in the process right now as we speak. A couple weeks ago, we re-elected a national Democratic chair. A few weeks before that, we elected a new state party chair and officers. Now what happens, we re-elect county and district officers in the next month or so. And it just so happened that his resignation effectiveness is hitting now right around these dates that we were organizing. So the county party chair had a question to ask. Do we try to move forward during this period or do I kind of hold off on this a little bit to get through the precinct organization? 
And in the end, the decision was made to hold off on this instead of trying to move this and expedite it. And part of the reason, Ben, is so we could go ahead and get all these precincts organized. And I'm proud to say out of, I think, the 21 precincts, my understanding as of right now, 19 of the precincts are organized. That's a good thing, y'all. In the Edgecombe. Mm -hmm. Yep. And my understanding, um, we're still waiting on at least one more. And under the rules, you can still organize those last two. Um, the period ended yesterday. The precinct period ended yesterday. But under the rules, you now have another two-week makeup period. And that's what, that's what this whole issue is about. It's about how we're restructuring the party. And, and so we're still waiting. This is an incomplete list right now. We're still waiting to get all the information in. But once we get the last two precincts, we can really shoot all this information out to everybody. And, um, and everybody will be on the same page. Um, I don't know right off the top. I would need um, um, Higgs. Uh, and, and let me share this. Um, the Democratic Party, we have an information management system. It's called NC Vote Builder, Victory Van. I can tell you I have worked with your chair. I personally entered the data of Edgecombe County into the van, and that hasn't happened in a while. But Edgecombe County is in good shape. You're probably in better shape than many of the other 14 counties in the district right now because of this sheriff's situation. So. So I'm just saying, I know there's been a lot of discussions on this stuff, but I just want to give you now the stuff that's been going on in the background, and maybe sometimes we don't always know the full story, and it's easy to you know, form some conclusions if we don't know what's going on. And that's why I'm just trying to be transparent. So is, there, uh, <clears throat> is that open to the public? Is what, what you just talked about right now, the van? I'm sorry? The van. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. That's, a, that's um, owned by the party. That the party's access, let me put it this way, is owned by the party. My question is, how do the county Democrats find out? We'll talk about that. I'll get Thank to you. it. Okay. Okay, we're getting there. And I'm winding down. What to expect in, okay, I just want to hit on a few points and then we'll get into all the questions. What to expect next um, for the candidates? Actually, let me say a couple other things before we get there. This is, this is the difference between this process and the regular filing process, going to file for office. There is no filing fee, there's no paperwork. All this is really word of mouth. If a candidate is interested and they express their interest, and the biggest thing is get a nomination. You gotta get a nomination. I wanna really emphasize that. What I also want to emphasize is under the rules, under Robert rules, even though four in particular candidates have presented themselves at this time, it doesn't mean that either one of them will be nominated, okay? That's not a guarantee to a nomination. That's the first thing I want to emphasize. Even if nominated, all four doesn't have to be nominated. It can be one or two, a combination thereof. And I would also re emphasize that there can be a, per a person to come forward that's it not might. been presented yet. Right. They can come forward because under the rules you have to open the floor. Right. You have to fully open that floor. And that means any eligible person at that point can be nominated. Now I was in, in one case I was working in a county and the person that won never did any of these forms or anything and actually went into one. That, I've seen that happen. <laughs> So I'm telling you, under the rules, that can happen. Another thing is even if you can walk into that meeting, you can be nominated at the meeting, you can come do your presentation at the meeting, then we're going to the voting, and technically, the executive committee members can still write in a person, even if they don't speak at the meeting. I mean, if you went as a write-in, this same process, this is how the rules work, so I'm saying all this, just don't take any of this lightly or for granted. Um, obviously at this point, we have the four candidates who presented themselves tonight, and we do appreciate that. 
If anyone is interested in being a candidate who's here tonight, or you know of anyone else, just get their names to um, the chair, get the names to me. Um, and the biggest thing for those who are candidates right now, understand this process, because I don't want anybody to feel slighted by the process that they got done wrong, okay? Um, seek a nomination. Get somebody to nominate you. Um, next, work on that three-minute speech because it's going to be your last opportunity to present. Present, And um, if you have questions, reach out to me and anybody um, so that we can get your questions answered. Executive committee members, okay? If you are an elected official, you are an executive committee member. If you are a precinct chair, vice chair, you are an executive committee member. Who's executive committee members who are here? Raise your hand. See, we have some right here. Raise your hand high so they can see. I want everybody to see. Okay, so we have some executive committee members right here. If you are an executive committee member, make sure you understand this process and share it with others. And expect calls and people to reach out to you, especially as we get closer and closer to the end. Expect that. That's your role and job as an executive committee member in these processes. Um, if someone comes to you and say they're interested, get that information, pass it up to us so that we can communicate and make sure everyone, um, all the interest names are shared. If you cannot attend, go ahead now and start working on a proxy, okay? These are things, if you are an executive committee member, if you have questions, let us know. All right, here's where we're going the timeline. Our goal, this is my goal, this is a list of executive committee members right here that we know of. Um, if you, we want to get this information out because if you see any errors on it, we want to correct the errors. We want an accurate role when we show up. So if you see an error, you have questions about it, let us know. Our goal is to do this fairly. Um, the other thing that I would share is we can give you, and I have no problems disseminating a partial complete list, okay? But do realize this is not complete at this time. We will make a commitment to have to you by March the 17th a complete list, okay? By March the 18th is our deadline for noticing this meeting. The meeting is going to be held on March the 23rd, okay, at 6 o'clock. Um, at the Edgecombe Community College Tarbo site in the atrium, 6 o'clock, okay? March the 23rd is that, take, that date. Um, under the rules, we have five days to give the notice. So I just want to let everybody know, and I'm going to explain the five-day rule. It's five days based on the postmark of the letter, the notice itself. So whenever that date appears on the letter from the post office, that's day one, then you count five days and you can have the meeting. And that's the requirement un under the plan. We plan then to submit to the chair of the Edgecombe County Board of Commissioners on March the 24th, the recommendation from the Edgecombe County Democrat Party. Once it's transmitted to the Board of Commissioners, um, it's up to them at that point now to place it on their agenda. I would imagine I cannot speak for the Board of Commissioners. We've never tried to do that, but it may be the next meeting or so, but this is the most important thing I can articulate is regardless of when they place it on the agenda, they're bound by that recommendation. They have no choice but to seek that person as long as we get this done by March the 30th. All right, so we talked about background, purpose, eligibility, plan of organization, all these rules and stuff, um, what to expect, um, things that have taken place prior to the executive committee. I have my contact information, Reverend Higgs, um, and I really want to answer questions that you may still have at this time, and my commitment is, um, if you would like this slide, this is what I always try to do in this process is share information and get it out there. I will email you the slide, okay? And if you, um, if we start conversing, you know, on the email list with me, then I will email you the notice 
and any information going out from here on in this process. Um, I would also add that the chair has essentially appointed me in his authority to kind of be the spokesperson uh, for this process moving forward. Because like I said, we're trying to now get a rein on you know, the, the, the communication on this. We're going to have a smooth, transparent, and a fair process. That's my guarantee. I would love to answer any questions you may have. Uh, yes? First, what's your contact information? My contact information, please take this. I'm going to start with my email address. Please shoot me an email. And I was trying to, I, I was trying to figure out, I had a notepad I was going to sit around, but I knew everybody was signing in, so I was going to ask you in advance or later if I could get a copy of the sign-in sheet, and I'll email this to everybody that placed email addresses. But if for some reason you either don't want to wait or you haven't heard back, send me an email, and it's Don Davis, D-O-N-D-A-V-I-S, 34, at gmail.com. Don Davis 34 at gmail.com. Don Davis 34 at gmail.com. If you want to, just go ahead and send me an email now or later tonight. Just to say, hey, please send me the information. I'll, I just want to make sure I have your contact information to share information. And I will get everything out to you. So please email me. My cell number is 252. 341 5548. 252 341 5548. Please do not hesitate to call me. I've already been getting a lot of calls already anyway. Again, what my goal and aim is to get this information, and if I can get all everybody on the same page, singing off the same sheet, then we're all going to know what to expect. There are no surprises. So, DonDavis34 at gmail.com, cell 252-341-5548. Thank you. Yes, sir. I understand the precinct allegation of votes is based on the turnout for the government who is for election. Yes, sir. How is it done for elected officials? One vote for elected officials. Did everybody hear that question? The question was... What's the voting capacity of elected officials and those who consider ex officio voting members as opposed to your um, precinct members? And that's one vote. Yes, sir. Um, I understand you said that uh, a member of the committee has the right to be a part of the process. Yes, sir. But to also participate. To participate. In the process. Yes, sir. Also, uh, you have to be nominated. By a committee member. Can that committee member nominate themselves? Yes. That's absolutely. That's what I mentioned earlier. And that's what I want to be clear. The question was again if I'm on the committee, can I nominate myself? Absolutely. The only thing, interestingly, on the Robert Rules, it says you cannot, as a member, nominate any more than the number of vacancies that's occurring. So under the rules, <coughs> No committee member can nominate any more than one person. The only way that you would overcome that, which I did have one case where the committee came and adopted a special rule that they could uh, uh, nominate multiple people, but under Robert's rule, subject or absent of a special rule of the day, you can only nominate one person in this case. Other questions? The, yes, sir. You talked about the uh, <coughs> excuse me process for the precinct chairs. Can the county commissions, I mean the um, elected officials, have a proxy? Yes. And if they can, who can be their proxy? I already know. I mean, mm -hmm. um, under the plan, it specifically uh, says it should be out of the precinct. Okay, so you should get someone out of the precinct. And that goes for that goes for the uh, countywide officials too. I'll put it this way, um, that's what the plan says. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to make that clear because let I let think me, some I'm people didn't know. I'm going to just do this real quick. I know time's late and probably went a little longer, but has this been helpful? Yes. I'd mean, rather at least if it's helpful. If it's not helpful, I will definitely. Okay, just to let you know, right now, this is who we have listed as your precinct chairs. 
um, Colin Webb, Mary Hinton, Thomas Anderson, Ethel Collier, James Merrill, George um, Barnes, Cornelius Dancy, um, Ella Ruth Collins Hopkins, um, Jesse Earl Petaway, Sam Branch, um, Ernest Taylor, Virginia Williams, Donna Johnson, Otis Jordan, um, Janice Bullock, James Williams, Lawrence Taylor, Brenda Knight, um, Bronson Williams. Those are your precinct chairs. I'm letting the candidates know now because I don't want anyone to say, to feel that you got to wait and figure out who they are to start trying to get a nomination. Your vice chairs, these individuals can also nominate Judith Moss, Quincy Robinson, Roosevelt Higgs, um, Barry Anderson, Honey Hole, Jesse Eason, Wilbert Harrison, Lewis Higgs, Annie Manning, um, Mamie Cobb, Earlene Petaway, Dorothy Tucker, Effie Lee Jackson, Paul Davis, Thomas Cherry, um, Clara Knight, um, Ashton Halton, and then your officers also have voting authority. And your officers of the Edgecombe Party are Roosevelt Higgs, Martha Johnson, Robert Byrd, Gladys Shelton, Stephanie Hunter, Glenda Knight. So I'm giving you the names, everybody that we have as of right now, and you know who all the elected officials are across the county. They're, that's the other group, and that's a list of people here. I'm not going to read all those names. You know who they are. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Can you give some copies of that? Um, I'll put it this way. This is still incomplete. I would rather just email it. So if you email it to me, I will get this out to you. I mean, obviously you can see it is, um, you know, still a work in prog prog uh, progress. I'm gonna put current as of on the bottom. I just don't want to delay information, but I need you to understand that this is not the complete list and don't, please don't come back later and say, oh, how did these people get up here? Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, we can make sure the phone numbers are up there. You called two, some people names twice. Can you explain about that? Yes, I appreciate you saying that, uh, bringing that up. The question was, I've mentioned some people twice. You can actually, under the rules, hold office at a precinct level, and for example, also, you can hold office at the county level. Your chair, Roosevelt Higgs, he's the county chair as well as the precinct chair. Some of your elected officials are not only elected officials, but they're also precinct chairs. So they're holding multiple titles. However, this is what I want to emphasize. Under the rules, they can only vote in one capacity. Correct. So they can't go and cast all these votes. They have to vote in one capacity. Is that? Yes. Um, could you uh, reconfirm that everything is within the statute timelines? We're not at jeopardy or violating any um, processes. Everything under, is under the state law, we have it to March the 30th. That's the date. And I'm just being blunt about this. You know, I'm here representing the party in this case. There's just no way, as a party, you give up your recommendation authority. I mean, that's a pretty strong authority under the law of North Carolina that whoever you recommend will be seated, must be seated. And why would the party just concede and give that to the county? Now, if the party, the executive committee, decided they didn't want to exercise authority, then that, that's a whole other case. But I'm just saying if the executive committee desires to exercise authority, they should be given that opportunity to do so, which we're gonna have that meeting on the 23rd, and then have it submitted on the 24th, and we're still six days ahead of schedule. When should you have a proxy in? Anytime before that meeting is gaveled in, called to order. I mean, you can turn it in, now that I'm giving out more specifics, the date is the 23rd, 6 o'clock. If you know you're not going to be there when we have executive committee members here, go ahead and get your proxies turned in right now. I mean, you can do it tonight. Other questions? Yes, sir. Now you're saying the proxy, but now you're saying go ahead and turn it in, but does it need to come from the portal? Or can you, or do you create your own now? I mean, 
It doesn't matter. I mean, just, just want to put it out there. Proxy okay. form, and the question is, in the party traditionally, we've just come up with a form to help make this process easy. Um, but the legal, the technical answer is when you draft the proxy with the language, and you're giving that person your authority, and you sign off on it, then that's what's legally binding, not the form that is on. Any other question? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. First, I'd like to thank you for uh, accepting the challenge and coming on behalf of the party to help facilitate this process. But I would like for you again to address section uh, 2.2 as it relates to the voting. If only one of the representatives of chair or vice chair shows up, will you address that? Right, that's what I was saying before. And um, what I emphasized is in the cases of the precinct, okay, in the cases of the precinct, for some reason you have votes that are shared from that pre precinct by two people. If a chance one do not show, then the other one gets all the voting authority. Otherwise, they're split in half. And let me share this. Um, and I'm going to skip here. It looks like um, one and four were combined. And that's 23 votes. Tarboro 2 has 12 votes. Tarboro 3 has 8 votes. Kanita, 4 votes. Speed, 2 votes. Lawrence, 3 votes. Leggett, 2 votes. Whitaker is 5 votes. Um, Battleboro, 9 votes. Old Sparta, 4 votes. Um, Michaelville, 2. Pine Tops, 8. Lewis, Four, Rocky Mount one, 26 votes. Rocky Mount two, 12 votes. West Edgecombe, 12 votes. Rocky Mount four, 12 votes. Rocky Mount five, eight votes. Um, um, uh, Temperance Hall, three, and Sport, um, Sharpsburg, one. Okay. I'm sorry. Right, that's, um, looks like 23 votes. That's the one that's combined, I think. Right, that's the combined, 23 votes. So, again, you can add those votes, vote totals up, and I'm telling you what the campaigns you should be doing. Looking, when I get this information out, look, you understand where all the votes are. Your name of this game is to get to 50% plus one. So I'm sure everybody's going to be hitting up that Rocky Mountain one. That's why it's so important to know who coming Well, I mean, you, you see what I'm saying. Like I said, if I can put it out there, the information is not going to be the, 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 become your strategy in terms of lack of getting it out there to give one person an advantage over the other. We're going to get it out to everybody, and y'all do your own politics. That's what I'm trying to do. And the last thing I want to address in terms of the meeting facility, if you want to pass out handouts the night that of, you want to put up poster boards or anything, please bring it. Feel free to put it up. Just clean it up. That's the only <laughs> thing we're asking. You take it, whatever you bring in, take it out with you. And the reason I say this, I mean, it's not every day we go through these processes and Sometimes people show them, there's all this stuff, it's like, well, I didn't know I, I could have done that. So you can campaign. Come in, just clean it up, please. Anything else? Have we covered it all? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Can we have a sidebar? Just one minute. Yes, sir. And, and I do want to thank you for bringing this to my attention. Uh, there was one thing that I misspoke on, and that is, in the case of the two, of the chair and the vice chair of the precinct, and please make this correction, and I'll, if you send the information, I'll re reiterate this. Actually, you're only entitled to half of those votes, so I do want to stand corrected on that. And that's under section 2.02. .02. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Yeah.
Under okay, I'm gonna do, I'll just read it directly. This is out of the bylaws. It says, under no circumstances shall either the chair or vice chair be able to pass more than one half of the votes to which a precinct is entitled, um, even though the uh, the other is absent. I said before they get the entire entitlement, but actually that is not accurate. And I apologize. I probably and I apologize. Um, anyway, I just want to make sure it's clear. That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. Now, I know you've said this, but just for clarity again, I am planning to be there, for example. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I have an emergency and there's no proxy. So the vice chair is what you're indicating. Right, I only get this half. Okay. Now, I, want to be, I want to make sure everybody gets that because it is a correction to what I said. And I do apologize for that inaccuracy. And thank you very much for bringing that to my attention. I think everything else is probably accurate. Mm -hmm. Tell them where they can find the plan of organization. They can go up and pull it on the internet. Uh, the plan of organization, too, if you have any questions and you want to cross reference the slides when you get, get it, um, you can go to the North Carolina Democratic Party's website and pull it down. These are the bylaws as well as you can do to a search on the national DNC bylaws, uh, bylaws and charter, and you can also pull those down and verify and corroborate everything that's been said tonight. And, and truly, like I said, I do apologize on that one point. Um, I do have a slide on it, and I was, I'm speaking off the top, and I probably wasn't totally referencing that slide, and I do apologize for that. But I'm big enough to own up to that. But the thing is that if the chair or the vice chair makes the other person their proxy, then they get the... No, they cannot. Cannot make the That's a great question. If I'm the precinct chair, can I proxy for the person that's not there? I can only vote in my capacity. I can't proxy for another person. Unless I'm proxying for them, but then I can't vote in my capacity. So if, the, say if one of the precinct chairs that is correct. That is absolutely correct. That's correct. That's correct. <coughs> Anything else? And I do emphasize that piece on the precinct again. I just hate to get inaccurate information out. I'm, I'm hard on myself at times. I just like to say. I didn't bring that to your attention because I knew that you wanted to share. And I'll tell anybody in this room, my dealing with Senator Davis and also at the state level, because uh, when we first scheduled this meeting, I let him know early on that I was 99.9% .9 certain that we'd be calling upon him. And I guess about maybe three weeks to a month ago, the state party uh, from Riley called and they told me, said, Reverend Higgs, if y'all need anybody to help you, they don't know of anybody else in the state that had carried out these proceedings any more or better than Senator Davis. So we have the best of the years here in Escombe County to help us with this matter. Thank you again, Senator. So did you have one other thing? My question is a precinct where the odd number of delegates who gets the odd. Um, it's split in half. You get the point five. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what does this say right here? Precinct members. Precinct members are prohibited from casting more than half of the votes, even in the absence of the other precinct member. So it's on my slide. I just misspoke. That's that's the point I'm making. I do apologize for that. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for your commitment to democracy. And we'll see you on the 23rd. Send, send me an email. We'll get this information out to you.